Okay, hello everybody and welcome to Investing with IBD sponsored by Vantage Point. Today is December 9th, 2020. I'm your host, Arisha Pierce, and we have Ross Haber on the show. Ross is a former portfolio manager for William O'Neill, and he is also the co-founder of TraderLine.com. Thanks for being here, Ross. Thanks for having me. On today's podcast, we are going to talk about the current markets. We're going to talk about how you make a, take a trading strategy and make it your own, and then we will end with a few current stocks. So let's get right into the current market. The current market is in a confirmed uptrend. We have one distribution day on the NASDAQ, three on the S&P 500. Ross, what are your thoughts on this market? Well, I would have liked to do this yesterday instead yeah, of seriously. today. Um, you know, it, it, it's very tough to tell one, one uh, hard day, you know, a volatility off the top doesn't really tell you much. It's going to take... Listen, as our buddy Scott O'Neill loves to say, we're in the uh, interpretation business, not the prediction business. So it's, yep. you know, everyone wants to know what's going to happen. Is this the beginning of a new bear market with one, you know, volatile day? So, you know, I'm sure a lot of people, including myself, took a little haircut and profits today, if not a big haircut, depending on how quick you were. And, uh, you know, it's just about. So for me right now, you know, I'm, as I'm, I'm trying to keep my account near highs as we yep go into the end of the year or so where I was a little quicker on the trigger today than, than maybe I would otherwise be if I wasn't trying to, you know, protect my performance into year end. You know, that, that, that's interesting. Cause I, that was kind of going through my mind today too, where it was like, you know, there's only a few more weeks left in the year. I feel like there's more risk now, just if you're looking from kind of the performance ego kind of level, Right. It's like I want to kind of keep it near yeah. those highs. Uh, there's more risk than reward at this point. It's funny how quickly your mind changes. I'll be honest with you. You know, I've been trying to do some partial profit take. And as the market's been, been getting extended up off its 10 day stocks are and I was selling a few things yesterday and today, watching them gap back up and go straight up. And it's amazing how fast my mind, your mindset will go worry about the little bit you were missing, you know, yes. taking some proactive sales off the table to holy cow, I. You know, uh, had I only been a little, a little more proactive, you know, so, yeah, so it, and, you know, you go from worried about me, you know, I'm not letting the trend work for me, you know, the Santa Claus rally into the end of the year, I'm, I'm letting my fear of losing profits dictate me, which is, you know, a rule, really, am I one of my rules not to sell for fear of losing profits. But on the flip side, you know, as you get to those last few weeks to the end of the year, you know, that that psychology starts to mess with you it did it, it, it really messed with me today i i, I think I, I in the morning i was for some of those stocks that were gapping up i i started lightening up but not as, as you said not a, not enough uh but then i was at, when it, as it kept getting worse and then i you know it the kind of my fears came true here where all of a sudden things started to come a little bit more included now you're right you take a take a larger you take a step back look at the bigger picture it's only one day but we all know how quickly we can go from fearful to holy cow. It looks fantastic again in four to six days. Yeah. We also know that the stock, you know, we could see the market, you know, retesting its 50 day moving average in half that time. It's just we, the volatility is, has been uh, no stranger. That's for sure. Yeah. Now, uh, do you, so, so when you look at overall markets, do you ever look at, uh, kind of the psychological indicators, things like that, uh, that's one of the, you know, my top visits to uh, Investors Business Daily is the psychological indicators page. I mean, I, I, I try to keep track of put call and some things during the day, but I, along with the uh, big picture and, you know, going through, you know, all of the chart sections, what, yeah, whatever yeah. they may be that, you know, the psychological indicators page is one of my favorites to uh, go through. So, yeah, I, <clears throat> I, I pay close attention to it. I, you know, we've seen put call has been extremely low. I don't know where it finished uh, the session today. I know, uh, you know, McClellan Oscillator has been showing more or less overbought. Um, in general, I like to see those two things in addition to, uh, I mean, I love that. When you get the, the uh, bearish, the bearish bullish sentiment mm -hmm. um, to go along with you, obviously that's a huge plus, but the three that I'll, I'll typically um, will will cause me to react will be uh, the put call 
McClellan and the VIX. Those yep. three, if those three are showing at extreme levels all at once, I become concerned. If it's just one, maybe two, I'm yep. going to let the action of the leaders dictate what I do. Okay. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. I, I didn't look at the put call ratio uh, recently, yeah. but I, wow. it, Is that today's- it's really low. I yeah. didn't realize that he was even that low. Last I took a look, it was low. I think it was low 60s, high 50s. So yeah, right. Me too, yeah. But that's extremely low. Definitely not a bad time to uh, be a little cautious. So. Yeah. And, and you know, the and we've shown this on IBD Live uh, also. But uh, the the other kind of concern we have, this is the, the bulls it's bears. It's been up there for a while. And look at that. You yeah. It, it's it's above 60. It's been like hitting that. And this is over a two year chart. And and so and for those. A, four, a 46, yeah. Put call. It's It's time to reel it in a little bit. You have to be a little bit, yeah. You have to be, be a little bit more careful. Um, be a little uh, proactive. It can't hurt to sit, but I'm not saying it's time to go out and blow out your Tesla that you own from two or you know 100 or 200 right. split or whatever it may be. Right. But it, you know anything that you've added recently that's gotten super extended and you're you want to you want to really if you're looking to protect gains, I like you know I'd like to. I think we all do. It's just the competition uh, versus ourselves, right? That performance yes. in the year really. That's, yeah. It, it, exactly. It's for uh, me. Yeah. So, so Ross, l- l- you know, so let's, let's take a step back here and let's go back an, a, a number of years and, and let's get into your background. How did you get into this? Cause I, and, I, and I'll just give the listeners a little bit of background. When, when I was an IBD customer, I went to, I think it was 2002. Uh, I went to an IBD seminar uh, with Bill O'Neill and, and I'm pretty sure you were the portfolio manager there uh, helping Bill O'Neill and, and doing, and you were doing one of the presentations. Yeah, I did quite a bit. I mean, when I did it with Bill, I did it for a couple of years and I was half the day, half of the day was him. Half the day was me. Um, mm-hmm. I, the speaker came on, I think during lunch and, and talked about the paper for a while, but basically Bill would do the half of the workshop. He did all weeklies. I did all dailies. And that's how we split it up. I was daily guy. He was weekly guy. And then we answered questions together at lunch. So how did you get into this? How how did you get into investing? How did you end up working for Bill O'Neill? Uh, you know that was a question I had years ago when I was in that seminar. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it, it's kind of a crazy story. Um, I, I did business school at University of Florida, but I really had no huge desire to be involved with the stock market. If anything, I was probably leaning more towards um, something in real estate development, but that's neither here nor there. Um, At the end of the day, when I graduated, um, a friend of mine told me he was having a great time as a stockbroker at all the discount stockbrokers and that they were, you know, office full of young guys. They were having a great time. I should come check it out. And so Mm -hmm. one thing let, you know, so that's basically how it all started a few months out of uh, college. I just Rather than going to grad school or any of that stuff, I just decided to check out this job at, you know, as a stockbroker, went down there. I thought it was, I was sold upon walking in the office. It was, uh, so anyway, yeah. I was hired there. The first book they gave me to read there before even the Series 7 manual was How to Make Money in Stocks by William O'Neill. So that's incredible. Just like that, <laughs> you know, the very first book, other than what I was, you know, forced to read in my finance classes was that book. Um and that office just happened to be one of all these private brokerage centers. They had seven out of, let's say, 250 offices nationwide, where that was what they pitched. That was how they brought in accounts. So every day they were running the spreadsheets of, you know, the smart select ratings, if you will. There weren't quite yeah. as many. Then. And we were keeping track of earnings and all of that. And the funny thing is, so anyway, that was my first, you know, so... I have known nothing but Bill O'Neill since 1995. And obviously having the opportunity to eventually come work with him, I realized you think you know so much at that point, well, relative to everyone else you do. And I get yeah. to with Neil, I talked to a few people and realized I knew nothing. So 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 you end up so so you're in Florida and then you, you get an opportunity to work uh, right. For, first for... job out of this uh, as a retail broker, first book they get, you know, eventually yep. they get you the series seven and yep. uh, so I learned the business there. I learned who William O'Neill was right off the bat, even before I knew the first, you know, fact I had to know to pass my Series 7 license. Um, so after a time there, I moved on to another firm. And it just so happened a client that I had picked up there was a huge O'Neill fan. You know, she went to the workshops and all of that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, there, back during that time, uh, there was no 
it, it was Charles Schwab, all the discount stockbrokers, and maybe a few other small discount firms, one of which I, I went to because they were opening a new office. And, you know, long story short, if you're the guy who starts a new office, you're, you're going to do well because they, okay. need to, they, they need to bring assets in. So right. I, I, figured, I figured that out quickly um, upon entering Oldie and when I saw the opportunity to uh, start an office with the very – so anyway, that's what happened. I, and um, one of my clients – so during that, I digress, let me back up. So because during that time, there were no E-trades and super cheap um, online trades to be had, you were either at a full service broker like a Merrill Lynch, JP Morgan, whatever it was, or a discount broker like Schwab or Oldie, yep. um, where you could trade for $20 commissions independent on how big your account was, how many shares you were trading, it could be free. Um, so. During those times, what people would do is they'd have an account, half their a chunk of their money with a discount broker, me, and a, another chunk of their money with a full service broker. So one of my clients and a huge O'Neill fan had an account with me and the other chunk of her money with a guy by the name of, and I think we'll all know him as of Gil, Gil Morales when he was still a broker at Payne Weber. So yeah. Gil was- And 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 uh, just to, to let you, uh, Gil, long time, a long time portfolio manager for, for William O'Neill too. Yep. Yep. He was also as, as oh, let's say manager of institutional services. Absolutely. How yeah. I got my start there. So our mutual client, so Gil and I actually knew about each other well before either of us were at William O'Neill through our mutual client. Um, just because she told each other about the other. So one day she called me up and asked me, Hey Ross, how'd you like to go work for Bill O'Neill out in Southern California? I thought she was, you know, you know, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm not kidding. Do you remember I told you about my other broker, Gil? And so happens he's now running institutional services there, and uh, they're looking for some new blood in the department. I think you know, basically he he had asked her if she knew anyone that knew the system well that you know she thought would be a good fit, and so she had me call Gil, and uh, yeah, let's just I'll I'll say it right now. He was a huge a huge um, impetus in in where you know if it wasn't for him i wouldn't have been hired at william o'neill and company if it wasn't for him i wouldn't have been um i wouldn't have had the position at at finity capital that i had either so that's great you took good care of me while i was there that's for sure so 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 you you work you work for for bill for for a number of years and then so what we can transition a little bit further you ended up uh getting a chance to work for a, another fund manager too right Yep, and I didn't mean to push. So yes, I got. I had the experience of institutional services. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, we don't have to get into the whole long story about how I wound up becoming a portfolio manager. We can, if you'd like to back up. It doesn't matter to me. Your call. But uh, so yes, <laughs> after developing a track record and you know really getting a handle on the methodology, um, yeah, there was a gentleman who was a client, an uh, institutional client. He was um, old Fidelity or prior Fidelity uh, portfolio manager. And he was looking, you know, I had a huge respect for the methodology and the technicals along with the fundamentals. And he had actually come originally to hire Gil, who was not interested in, in leaving and uh, he introduced them to me. So that's how that all happened. Um, so I hit it off with uh, David, you know, my partner that I was running Finity Capital with. And uh, we had so that anyway, so yes, that's how that happened. One. And so, so you, you had, I mean, it was pretty, really, really cool experiences, right? You got a chance to work with, with Bill, with Gil, with David. Uh, and, and then so after that, after managing money for a while, because you, you're a portfolio manager at both spots, uh, then after 2008 and, and things like that, you started to now you've learned, get, got all this experience. You, you decided to kind of get back and start teaching it, right? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the, um, the financial crisis happened, birdie made off happened. It yeah. didn't matter how well you did. People wanted their money back. And, you know, it was just one of those periods where we could have, anyway, David was very interested in retiring and being with all of his children. So we wound up closing the fund. He retired. And yes, I went and managed my own money and, uh, got into yeah, the, you know, newsletter writing and teaching thing was shortly thereafter. And so now you're, you're with Trader Lion and, and one of your motivations is really to help educate others uh, to trade uh, for themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, 
I, I think I might have even mentioned to you before, you know, the one, you know, I look it's hard not to look up to Bill O'Neill, forget his market genius. The one thing I've always noticed that was impressive is that, you know, at all costs, he always pushed to teach and yeah. really make sure people understood and knew. I mean, the bottom line is it worked. It changed my life. I watched it change the lives of people that, you know, we were doing the workshops with and for um, the people around me at Investors Business Daily. I'm sure you've probably got a similar yeah, story. Absolutely. Um, you know, anyone who tells you that uh, canceling doesn't work or doesn't work anymore, I've only got, here's how, look, here's my answer. They're doing it wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It no, it's, it's a proven methodology. And if you've got, the, if you get the rules down and understand that it's not a, it's not, nothing's black and white in the stock market. If it was, that would have been, uh, you know, there'd be a computer running the whole thing and we'd, we'd, we'd have been out of a job a long time ago. But because, you know, there's hard art that, you know, that's, I think, and I, anyway, I, no, I no, no, you, and you're, you're, you're getting to it because it, it, it's almost a perfect segue for, for the, the next segment. There is a lot of art, even though, it, and it's funny when you learn Can Slim, when you learn the rules that Bill O'Neill re really put out there, it, it seems very black and white. You know, these are the stocks you look for, this is how you buy, how you sell. After doing it for a while, you learn there's a lot of gray. And so, really and this is what we'll talk in the next segment we'll take a quick break here but what we're going to talk about in the next segment is learn kind of the larger concepts of a trading strategy and in, in this case ross and i number and plenty of others learn can slim but then you got to make it your own so we'll talk about the importance of making that trading strategy your own because this is how you really take it to the next level but uh the market is in an uptrend growth stocks are acting well but Remember to be disciplined, okay? Uh, don't chase the stocks. Take a look at some of those stocks that you might have profits in. Uh, and, you know, and uh, definitely take a look at some that might be giving some warning signs too. But we'll take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk more about the importance of making a trading strategy your own. We'll be back. Stock market have you nervous? With the hope for a COVID vaccine and a shifting political landscape, it's virtually impossible to guess what will happen. But with Vantage Point, you don't have to. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how Vantage Point's AI technology can forecast stock market trends up to three days in advance with incredible accuracy. Vantage Point's patented technology analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds. Stop guessing. Check out www.freestockcoaching.com and experience Vantage Point for free. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Ross Haber is our guest on Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. Okay, Ross, let's talk about trading strategies. And, and really, you know, you learn those larger concepts, as I mentioned in the, in the, at the end of the previous segment. But there comes a point where you have to make it your own. And just to give a little quick background... I, even at IBD, I get to work with a number of, of people who've been studying the system for 20, 30 years. And it's amazing at how different we all trade and how the, the, the different types of stocks we're in too. You know, talk about this concept of really just kind of making your own and what you've seen over, over the years that you've been studying the style. Gotcha. So, you know, like you said, once you've got a system in front of you that you know has been proven to work and you've really got... Um, the, the basic rules down and it, it's become more of a second nature thing instead of having to go back and look, oh yeah, what yeah. was that I'm supposed to do again sort of thing. Right, Once you right. You got that, that confidence. Then you can, that's when, um, you know, you, you can kind of relax and start to pay attention, I guess, to the finer detail that, you know, exp you know, and uh, I think there's probably a lot of pattern recognition and, and a lot of that that goes along with the experience that you don't even realize, you know, when you're tabbing through a bunch of setups and that, and eventually your eyes will start locking on to yeah. you know, your setups. And my setups may be completely different looking than yours, and it doesn't mean they're any better or worse. As a matter of fact, they could be the same exact ones and depending on how and when we trade and trade it, our perceptions, what's going on in our personal lives, what's going on in our, the rest of the stocks on our, you name it, it's all, yeah. you know, it, we could have completely different results, whether we're on the same side or completely opposite sides of that trade. And Russ, so, so you, you reminded me of, of a real cool story that you were telling me before about recognizing these patterns, right? And recognizing these charts. How did you learn this, right? How, how did you learn, uh, how did you train your eyes really uh, to, to recognize these patterns? 
Well, I, I've got to thank Bill for it, really. Doing all of the research, making model books and having to teach those workshops. Eventually, you go through your umpteenth thousandth chart for the, um, you know, whatever, however yeah. many hundreds of or thousands of hours, I guess, at this point it's been. And it, um, you know, everything starts to click. Everything that I heard Bill repeat, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times, everything, I guess, all of the charts that I've seen having to go back and look at stuff, how it happened, you know, and then you'll start to look at the rules and you might start to notice, oh, look, there's, oh, there's accumulation here. And maybe I could have snuck, you know, wiggled my way in a little bit early that, you know, and it, it, it that sort of thing. And you'll get, everyone gets comfortable in their own way. So yeah. I'll, I give yeah. the perfect, I'll give you a perfect example, the stock NOW. Okay. Beautiful earnings. That thing goes straight up. I don't think I've ever made money trading that stock. I'll never trade it again. But it's because it's, it's it's yeah because it's one of those stocks. It's where yeah. I'm not you. It, it, you try and buy it on strength, and you better have a lot of patience. It's just one of those things. And I'm I'm I tend to like to buy at least a little you know strength with you know. I like to buy weakness within an overall trend, but after that, I at least like to see some, you know, some strength. And that's just one of those stocks. If you, you know, you got to be very careful buying a strong day because um, it, you know, just the way it, the way it trades. And some people, the way they trade, they're really good at buying them, you know, um, accumulating a stock as it comes into support, and they've been holding NOW forever, and it's their biggest winner. And yeah. for me, I prefer something that looks more like Tesla. Yeah. Like, a little it's, more liquid when it gets going, it goes. Yeah, no, it's it's so funny because I I, I Ser, service now is a company. I think it's an amazing company, uh, and and I was all over it last it year. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> say that again. I said it's top notch, and it does not. Yeah. It steals my money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it 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 I it was really hard to make any progress in service now. It, it would either, it would just wear me down because it just moves so slowly. And and then it would kind of just shake you out at, at the worst possible trade, it's times. One of, there's, it's the personality of it, and I've noticed. Yeah. That, you know, the, oops, they're dependent on. Um, so it's one of those ones that does a lot of the retracing of the prior yes. day, a lot of yes. outside, inside, outside days, and it yep. slow. You know, you, you've got to trade that stock on a weekly bottom line. Yeah. And yeah. So on weakness, and I don't, sorry to cut you off. No, 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 because you're talking about an important concept here about knowing the character stock, but really getting to know yourself and know, knowing what works for you. Uh, because there are gonna be, in the end, you have to fit the style, you have to fit the strategy to your own personality, and you have to uh, look back at your previous trades and, and figure out, okay, what stocks worked for me and which ones didn't? ServiceNow uh, didn't work for me, but uh, Tesla, worked really well so maybe i should try to focus on that type of character right and you'll start to notice there's i've you know in my eyes there there's the whip and they, it doesn't even have to be illiquid a lot of times less liquid goes along with whippy but it doesn't have to service now is a perfect example it's very liquid but yeah. it's got that whippy personality to it so you know there it's and after you look at enough stocks now I, I just skip those stocks. Anything that trades yeah. like that, it doesn't matter. I don't care how fantastic the earnings are. It's a waste of time. No, it's perfect. Yeah, point. I mean, that, that's a perfect answer right there because it's you're you're looking for the character and, and you brought up Scott O'Neill before, so I'll bring up Scott O'Neill now Yeah, because I learned this from him. Uh, how do you know the character's stock? You look to the left, there, right? Just look go. at how yeah. it's traded in the past, how it's yeah. handled breakouts, how it trends and, and, and things like that. Well, and there's your answer. Is how it did it and you will get a character change at times, but you, again, you wait for that to happen. You can't buy it and hope it happens. You can buy it and hope it happens, but I, I know how that, fit. I know how that story ends. So eventually you stop doing that. Yep. And, and so what, what are a few of kind of the, the key attributes you look for uh, in a stock, when you're looking at a lot of charts, you've trained your eyes that, that you're really custom going through tons of charts. Yeah, so for me, I'll tell you, you know, and maybe this will shed some light on what I'm looking at. My favorite number one, you know, and I've had Wanda, Panare, you name it. I Which see. Wanda and Panare are, are two of our and institutional platforms. Right. They're fantastic. And if you've got a giant soft dollar budget, you can't go wrong. However, yeah. if, you know, MarketSmith is an awesomely powerful tool. Um, 
the up on volume screen and market smith is the same exact up on volume screen that's in wanda and i'll tell you even when i had wanda that was still my favorite screen i run up on volume i sort it by relative strength um, a lot of times you might get some thinner or lower price stuff in there so then i might sort it by price from highest to lowest and yes okay. you might get some thin high price stocks but that generally you know and i just space bar through them and that I'm going to tell you that gets for me 80 to 85% of my watch list, just constantly watching that screen. Yep. And then sure, I've got IPO screens and some relative strength screens. And what I do as a, so here, I, I don't know, if I, it, uh, I digress a bit. So I use no, keep going. the alert system in, it you know, works very similar to Wanda, right? So yep. you, as it's going off, you can see, or, and if it doesn't, you can, create what you want to see in there, whether it be relative strength, what industry group it's in. So as I'm, co I'm constantly resetting those alerts throughout the day. Okay. I, and it, it really keeps me on top of market rotation. I know. So I have an idea of whether software is sagging together. You know, the greatest like part that. of it is, is you can sort those alerts by, you know, um, percentage up or down from your alert line. So, yeah. it, I mean, there's tons of great ways to, so, um, when I see a group starting to, let's say, set up, they all look like they're building solid right sides. I'm starting to see pocket pivots, the moving averages crunch up. I go, okay, time to look. And I immediately go into, and obviously, Market Smith want all of the um, William O'Neill uh, products make it possible to just pick that industry group. So again, I sort yeah. by relative strength. And then when I'm done, I'll sort by price just to weed out all the you know junk. And I'll tell you, between the up on volume screen, keeping an eye on IPOs and constantly um, screening the top industry groups. That's pretty much my alert list. And then out of those, I'm going to tell you, you know, the ones that hit my top 10 um, newsletter are, are typically going to be your most liquid institutional quality names. They're going to have okay. the triple digit earnings, um, yep. the, the solid sales to go along with it. I will give a break to a biotech name or something that, you know, where it might be missing the earnings, but it has the sales and it has the, uh, the product or, you know, it's the leader in terms of the product or service. So the, uh, you know, it's, it's changing. What do they say? We're, it, it's changing the way we work, the way we live, the That's way right. we live, sort of thing. So yeah. expecting Uber on the books makes no money, but look at that stock now on, you know, look at that IPO um, on the weekly chart now. Yeah. So I, yeah. So, uh, so what, what about the relative, uh, the RS line? The, so relative strength line. Okay, that's right. We spoke about this. So let me tell you something. And let me give, I, I got to give credit where credit's due. The, and this is the guy who he was my uh, client in institutional services. He actually was the one who uh, hired me away when I came, I came in to resign and Bill um, made an offer for me to stay and manage money for the firm, which as you know, I did. So anyway, he's the one who showed me he did. A, he's an excellent trader. And he showed me this in the nineties, you know, 99. He's like, Ross, let me show you something. And he's the one who put my eyes on that relative strength, new highs before price. And I made a little screen in Wanda that I kept for myself years and years and years ago. And I've been, you know, and obviously now because of you, we've got the blue line, the magical blue dot on market switch. <laughs> yes, that's right. And of all the things, you know, there's a, it, it, it's the greatest thing, you know, there's some things that, um, I think will work in work better in certain markets than others. And let me tell you, relative strength is just pure. It's the strongest stocks out there. So yeah. you've got a relative strength line screaming into new high grounds and a stock that's going sideways in a market that's probably, you know, going down while that stock's going sideways, which is why that relative strength line starts, you know, diverging to the upside and making highs ahead of time. I mean, that is, that's my, that's my favorite. That's where my attention is there until a legitimate breakout happens. And if the volume starts coming in and I see, you know, any of those early signs of accumulation, I'm, I'm a big fan of trying to buy stocks early and when pyramid my, my last position or last piece of my position at what would be your textbook breakout. I like breakout. to That's I interesting. Prior, yeah. If I can. Yeah, it, it, it's funny. It's, uh, the, the longer as I kept learning the system and, and going through a number of cycles, I've, I've kind of come to the same conclusion as you, that that RS line is the most important thing for me uh, these days. And then also the pyramiding in, that that, that is something that I've, I've continued to try to work more and more at because I was kind of traditionally trained, look for the breakouts, that's where you buy. But now buying as they're building the base slowly, pyramiding in, 
has helped me uh, manage some of these stocks a little bit better because if they pull back uh, after breaking out, at least I am not down as much and I, and I have a little bit lower cost basis. Yeah. yeah. And if you're, if you're accumulating it at a spot where, you know, what looks like typical accumulation, and it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong as long as, and this is the big thing, do you have a tight and reasonable? It's got to be a reason, a logical and tight stop. It, it can be yeah. tight, but if it's not logical, then you're just shaking yourself out and that does no good for buying it back the next time. It gives you no confidence and it certainly doesn't protect you the way that it should. Um, whereas if you're, you know, you see um, what looks like accumulation right above a 50 day moving average and you're giving yourself less than a percent and it's a super liquid stock, you can be wrong four times and keep buying it back as long as it eventually goes and all, you know, those little losses will disappear in a hurry. Yeah, no, that, 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 that's perfect. So going through a process of taking a trading strategy and really making your own is the way to take that performance to the next level. Coming up next, we will talk about a few ideas. Stay tuned. Tired of reading about other people getting rich in the stock market? Today is your day. Vantage Point's artificial intelligence has predicted countless market reversals, helping traders weather any storm up to three days in advance. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how their AI automatically recognizes global market patterns well ahead of the news to help you pick the best trade. Go to www.freestockcoaching.com to join a free live training session today. Don't delay, save your seat now. We are back with Ross Haber on Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. Okay, Ross, let's get into a few ideas. And you, you mentioned this stock the first, uh, the first uh, throughout the episode. So let's start off with that. Let's uh, start off with Tesla and, and give us your thoughts on, on this. I'll pull up the, the Mark Smith chart so we can uh, take a look at it too here. So give me one second. Okay, here we go. So I have a Tesla on a weekly chart. I have a position in it. I'm assuming I think you have a position in it. Yes, what do you sir. like about it? going all the way back to the bottom where you've got that long, you know, where the, there you go, where the original, you break out of that big long base, I guess that goes yep. back to, what is it, March 17? Yeah. Well, here, I see your, yeah, so that, and then you get that wild pullback to, is that, that's the two, what is it, the 40 week? Yes, the, the black line is the 40 week. Right, so anyway, I did not, I owned Tesla through that first run up, I did not sit through that. Uh, okay, so, so that, you, you were buying back here when they had that earnings gap and it kind of settled down for a, a bit. So back at the end of 2019, that that's where you were starting to buy it. And you caught that first initial run, right? Yep. And as far as earnings gaps go, that is typically how I'll handle them very rarely, unless it's one that has that insane power. Yeah. Then maybe I'll find a, a, I'll try to find a, that logical um, tight stop on an intraday. It's very tough. It's like trying to buy an IPO on its first day. I mean, yeah. you're, you're dealing with very little. So that's true. The, uh, so, so you get that, that original run and of course the pandemic hits and right. then it forms this really kind of, if you want to talk about V shape yeah. cup right here, I, it doesn't get much more V than this. And that's really why also it's, you, you've got a, like you say, there's the gray area. There's always the exceptions and, yeah. and it's not, listen, there's plenty of non exceptions that work phenomenally well, which is why if you just stick to those rules, you're, you're still going to, However, you know, as experience builds, you, you, you see that this EV um, thing is um, not, doesn't seem to be a fleeting uh, trend. Tesla's clearly the leader. I mean, look at the right. earning in sales. I mean, you've got a ton of these other little uh, follow on things that are, you know, shooting to the moon, but, you know, like Bill would tell you, stay away. Yeah, listen, maybe you want to trade some of those crazy things and try and, you know, in smaller size and add some, uh, you know, juice to the portfolio. But at the end of the day, really, all you need is a big concentrated position in the leader. And then the, the great part about it, you've got the earnings that make you feel nice and warm and cozy. The 99 <laughs> strength. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I think the um, sponsorship is blocked. If I remember correctly, you've got um, how many? Uh, well, I mean, we have like 1800 funds right now in it. And then how many of the, what is it? What do we call those? The, uh, the IBD Mutual Fund Index uh, owners, right, or the 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 good funds, the top rated funds that we that you show at the. Yeah, we, we have four right now in, okay. in it. Yeah, so, so, it, you know, it's, good so yeah, it's the liquidity, the the sponsorship. You know that whole. I mean, this has got the the. It's pretty much got it all, and yeah. you're talking. You know, the EV market is. I mean, if you're, I think you want to be in that group, and this is the leader. End of the end of the. 
you know, yep, into that story. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, and and there are, and and you you hit on a number of really good points. I mean, there there are just some stocks that are those institutional favorites, and it doesn't get much more game changing than the Tesla has, and it doesn't get much more controversial, or at least right. uh, you know people debate it a lot. Uh, but you know, if, if you know how to look for the stocks that can lead. And if they have most of the stuff, you know, Tesla has always been kind of on my radar for years and years. So, Ross, even before you brought up another really good concept, sometimes you're not going to find the best ideas just by screening and looking up on volume and, and for relative strength line and blue dots. You, you just have to keep your eyes open on everyday life. If, and, and so you brought up Uber, right, where now talking about another story that is – game changing in many yeah. ways if they ever put everything together and and put it in the excite institutions I mean, it got the revenues going. I mean but obviously we know you know the uber's a verb you know I mean yes people yeah. use all the other services but this is the leader um and you know, look at that I it does you don't have a classic IPO you turn it look like it started it got all kinds of crazy That's true right yeah you're you're through that IPO high now volume was huge and mm -hmm. uh you know, it would be nice to see some triple digit earnings eventually. I can see you don't even have, uh, <laughs> I don't know what we're looking at for 2022, um, but I can see, yeah, we have, there's been right. no annual earnings and out to 21 that's still looking for losses. So. Yeah. So it, it's one, just keep on, uh, on the, the radar, but it, it's funny that you just threw that out there because that's how I, that's how I think too. It's like, you know, you just kind of, I noticed when it reported that earnings, that gap, it's like, okay, now it is an all time highs. This could be one of those kind of things like I was thinking about Tesla eight, nine years ago. It's like, yeah, yeah you know, if they pull pull this off, it could be a great stuff. stuff. I'll tell you, right. It doesn't have the earnings. So I, right. I bought some, right? I want to say 470203, right around that okay. prior high. I think I snuck in a few pennies early. I didn't buy a whole lot. And it just happened to never gave me a chance to buy anymore. Yeah. And so, yeah, and and you know, and well, maybe not all the listeners. I mean, you what? see down there, I mean, you. Yeah. It, it got started much. I didn't buy. I bought, I didn't start buying until that old high on the left side, forty low 40, 47 and pennies. Yeah, which, which makes sense. I, I mean, they had earnings right before the election, and at least in California, they had something a proposition here whether they should, you know, whether all the in, in people working for Uber should be treated as employees versus contractors. Right. Um, so that that was a huge, huge kind of thing. But uh, but yeah, but it's it's really kind of that larger concept. You see some interesting ideas put on the watch list. Keep an eye on it. It may set something else up later on. Right now, it's extended. Um, but let's go to another one. And, and this is one that, you know, we all know about it. And, and probably the, the stock of 2020, the company that's positioned perfectly for the pandemic, uh, it's Zoom. Uh, and so what do you what did you like about these guys? And so do you still keep them on the radar? Pre-pandemic, I'm not, you know, I was you would have be, been hard pressed to find a stock with uh, better earnings and sales. And I've You're noticed right. a lot of times, even when you get a stock with the giant triple digit earnings, it, you'll have solid sales, but they're usually 30, 40, 50, maybe 60 percent. There's, you know, the triple digit accelerating sales with that ginormous earnings. I just you can't not. So in any event, yeah. we had all of that going for it before COVID even, you know, true. shut us all down. And then so right. that obviously lit it on fire. How far, you know, so it's come quite a ways, right? So we broke yep. out roughly at 100, went up yep. six times. So it deserves a break at least, right? We've hit its 50. It's not like we're pulling back to the 50 day for, so it's possible. Again, um, let's go back to, you know, what Scott used to, you know, that always sticks in my brain. We're here to interpret, not predict. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a lot of stocks that look like they're that look like they might be putting in a little head and shoulders top, and it, that's usually a day or two before they gap up and build a right side and take off and run another five times. But, okay. So who knows? So I'm I, I've sure. got my eye on this one. I have no idea which way it goes. You can see it at its 200 day. I mean, look at that. That that's not a a stock I'd have been in a hurry to buy on any day. Right. Um, right. That looks like it could take an easy trip to its 200 day moving average, but who knows in three days, you could see it back above 500 building a right side. We've seen it all. So yeah, no, it, it, it up six times in a hurry. So, and yeah. even though it had the earnings, you know, COVID COVID definitely uh, sent it flying. So a breather is good. Yeah. It's 34.6% off the highs right now. 
uh, it's 52 week high. Maybe build some really big base, take some time off. But I agree with you. This is something you just keep on the the radar and let the stock prove itself, right? We'll let the market tell us when to get back in. If it's truly done and it was kind of more a fad because of the pandemic, right. okay, fine. But I, I'm kind of leaning towards the other way that this is a great company and they do have a service and eventually, you know, I mean, they, they're probably going to be, uh, they're still going to do well, but they might, maybe they've just gone way ahead of themselves because of the, the pandemic. Yeah. You never know. It's, it's tough to tell. Yeah. So rather than try and tell it what to do, just watch it. It'll that's, tell you. Listen to the market. That, that, that's, that's the, the biggest thing. And speaking about, uh, uh, you know, listening to the market, <laughs> Amazon. Like that looks. I had been yeah, accumulating exactly. that one, and I eventually puked it all today. Yeah, well, with the market coming in. Yeah, I, I, and so, so yeah, it's like I just pulled up Amazon here. I went to the daily chart, and and so now we know why it was selling off hard today because Ross was getting out of his millions yeah, and millions of shares, right? But also, you know, and it bothered me yesterday. I was talking to uh, Ray about it, who I work with the trade line. Look at that relative strength line, new lows ahead of price. Yeah, that's, that's true. Thing. It deserves a red dot. <laughs> we might have to look at like the that. old service in LA before you had Uber Eats Pink Dot. You remember that, or were you still in diapers? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that much younger. Okay. I'm not that much uh, younger than you. I wish I was, okay. but I'm not. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you you do bring up a really good point here about the relative strength line within Amazon because it's not a secret here. This has been lagging the market for quite a while. I thought I would play it versus at 65 exponential. It was nice and tight. You had the volume dry up. But after today, I'm, I take my small loss. And if I'm wrong, I'll happily buy it back again. I lost a fraction of a percent. Yeah. You know, and in and, and a lot of ways, that's the, that's the risk management, right? Talk a little bit about that risk management. How, because, uh, I mean, you've been, obviously been doing this for many, many years. Taking losses, it's not really much of a bother to you, right? You're not getting emotional yeah. that you were wrong. No, not anymore. I mean, of course, it, it used to be hard, and now it's just like pushing the button for anything else. Yeah. It's definitely become a lot more um, robotic, but you know that has come with uh, you know the experience having to you know lose money, lose my temper, have yes. my better half get mad at me for losing my temper, yeah. and wanting to become a better person, and reading some books on how to. You know, stake a bit really, and it, I'm joking aside, it, a big part of it is that psychology and not just the trading psychology, which you can't beat from Mark Douglas. I can't, you can't listen to that book enough times. I've got it on Audible. I, I listen to it more than any of them all. But just in general, your regular, you know, your regular physical and mental well being. So you've got to be, uh, nothing comes, you, it's, it's hard to make anything good happen when you've got your head in a bad spot. So, I, you, you, yeah, I think I think you nailed it perfectly right there because the the rules are there, you know, the, the these rules work, but it, it it really just takes all of us years to actually get ourselves to follow the rules, and then you have to mentally keep yourself healthy too, and in the right spot to actually do the right things, uh, and and not beat yourself up when you go through those cold spells. That's going to happen to everybody. Period. Oh yeah. Every, you definitely go through the cold spells. And the, my thing is I just make it very, I make all everything very small until I get back on track again. I slowly make it bigger until it starts working again. And eventually, it, you know, a, a lot of the emotion goes away with that. It just becomes, Oh, okay. Time to walk away, start yeah. over, you know, whatever it is. Um, you start over and keep it small until you feel good again. Perfect, perfect. So there are a few ideas that are worth considering adding your watches. Thanks, Ross, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Next week, we will have Jim Ropel returning back to the show. Jim is the founder of Ropel Capital Management. So that's it for this week on Investing with IBD. I'm Arusha Pires, and thanks for listening. And for this week's Milton Charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. 
If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.